Oh, you bring it. Okay. Can I set up right now? Yeah, go ahead. Our next presenter is Jack Hand, Birds of a Feather, implementing analytics at the McGill Marlitz Hockey Program. A digital marketer by trade, Jack worked in web content and social media for the Montreal Canadiens before turning his attention to the coaching and management side of the game. He currently works as a video and statistics coordinator for the McGill Martlett hockey program and writes occasionally about analytics for Habs on Habs eyes on the prize. Sorry. Um, Jack. Ann. Okay. Okay. Will you hear me? Hear me? Yeah. Good. All good. So by show of hands, how many people here have watched women's hockey before? Okay, um, surprisingly good number. Um, how many of you have watched CIS Women's Hockey before? So Canadian University. N nobody here? One person? Uh, which team and when? <laughs> I'm just doing a little reality check here. Actually, we're, we're not even broadcast on CBC. So <laughs> I didn't expect anybody um, to, to have seen women's hockey from the CIS before. So I brought you some videos. These are some very select clips from the final game of our uh, provincial finals. So you're going to see six goals, probably six of the prettiest goals that you have ever seen. Um, so yeah, just, just enjoy it. Cause really, you know, today I'm not here to talk about stats per se. I'm just here to tell you a story and hopefully it'll be a very compelling story. So let's just. So this is our one through one power play. A rebound and then we have a this was a little bit fluky because that pass kind of went to nowhere, but then we get two lucky bounces and then we get the goal. This is a good one. So this is number 15, Gabrielle Davidson. You guys can call it Superman if you know him. Yeah. Uh, that's actually our check line. So we do a real nice job here at the end of the fuck out and then we'll do a turn around. Top uh, top turn. Top and open face off. That's going to be a little battle here. That's nice open ice. That's going to be Dayu, so she won gold medal with Team Canada and Sochi. So that's it. So that's it for the video. Let me get to the PowerPoint presentation right now. <clears throat> so. Okay. So, you know, imagine that you're five years old, you know, you're skating for the first time in your life and you just love playing hockey. You love everything about it. You love going to the games. You love going to practices. You love lifting weights in the summer. You love running. You just want to be the best player that you, you can possibly be. Right? Uh, you're 13, um, you're playing midget hockey, you're dominating the league, you're putting up three points a game. And the next step for you is, is you know, play major junior and then play in NHL and make a bunch of money, right? Now, imagine if you were born with, you know, XX chromosomes instead of XY chromosomes. So you're a girl. You're playing midget hockey, and the next step is, you know, junior and then university, because you're probably not ever going to make money playing this game, even though you might be just as talented, just as hardworking, just as passionate about the game. And really the story that I want to tell you guys today is the story of a team that's perhaps the greatest hockey team that you've never heard of, that you've never watched, and maybe that you'll never watch in person. So I'm talking about the Miguel Martlets, um, and this is the story. Um, so this is about me. You can ask me about my experiences afterwards. I'm not going to waste too much time on this, but actually I want to kind of take this time to talk about my parents a little bit. Um, I have a marketing background. I've never had a formal, you know, I guess computer or statistics or mathematics training beyond Calc 2, which was a few years ago. Um, but both my parents have postgraduate degrees in computer science and computer engineering. And it's, Kind of the story about how I got into analytics is 
when they never came to watch my games. So you have this joke about, you know, not watching the game, right? You know, stats guys don't watch the game. Well, my dad is a computer guy and he literally never watched my games. And so I was in high school and one day he came to watch me play. And after a game, he asked me, you know, like, why are you dumping the puck in so often? Because, you know, you work hard to get the puck. So why are you just giving it away? This is the guy who doesn't watch the game. Um, which, you know, I thought was very interesting. I had no ideas about any of the fancy stats back then because they just simply didn't exist. That was like more than 10 or 15 years ago. Um, but I think, you know, I still play hockey on a weekly basis. I don't think I've dumped the puck in, you know, more than twice every season for the past three years. And I got 64 goals this year. So thanks, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> And, and actually, that's why I'm walking with the cane, because um, when I'm short on breakaway, a guy tripped me, went to the boards. So I, I've got this for two weeks. So, yeah. Uh, meanwhile, my mom, um, she works in business analytics, which is really essential what I'm doing here. But compared to the work that she does, what I'm doing is really insignificant, because she works with such large data sets that I can't even comprehend what it is that she does. You know? Meanwhile, I'm just here playing around with Excel. So that's my parents. It's, I think... I've tried my whole life not to do the same things that they do, but you know, here we are. So. Okay, so, so uh, why analytics? Um, I got into hockey analytics a couple years ago while I was working for the Canadians because you know I was seeing some things play out on the ice, off the ice, and as somebody with a marketing background for me, it's always been crystal clear that the product is on the ice. So it's you know, it's not how many gifts you post on social media. It's not know how often you post on Instagram or Facebook for me like the product is on the ice so if you don't win then you know why should anybody care right so once again the product is on the ice and for me analytics is useful because first of all you can understand what's going on and you know perhaps win a few more hockey games but the second thing is it really lets us appreciate athletes who would otherwise either be overlooked or maybe unfairly given a bad reputation. You know, a guy like Jeff Petrie, who was perhaps public enemy number one in Edmonton, but who's now, you know, really seen in a completely different light and has since then been traded to Montreal. So good stuff. Right? Um, and the third thing is they bring more people to the game. So perhaps a good number of you here wouldn't even be interested in hockey or spend time watching games and tracking things to this extent if analytics wasn't a thing. Like I know for me for a long time, I worked in pro tennis and you know I traveled to cover tennis and I really didn't go on the ice or follow hockey for maybe two or three years. And that's really brought back that passion I have for the game, which I'm really thankful for. Um, on the picture here, you see Olivia Sutter. So she's one of our um, forwards. And she's the kind of player that you really learn to appreciate when you look at the underlying numbers because you know, she doesn't score a ton of goals, even though when she does score, like on this one, it's, it's always a beauty. So that's great. But you see, you know, the kind of minute that she plays and the kind of possession stat that she puts up. And, you know, she's a great teammate because she takes on those tough minutes so that her teammates can thrive. And that's really, I think, something that we can identify and really enjoy and, you know, really be thankful that we have her on the team, even though she scores maybe, you know, three goals a year. So uh, why McGill Martlets? I did my undergrad at McGill. Uh, a lot of my friends played on the hockey team, so I always knew of Peter Smith. Uh, if, in case you don't know him, Peter Smith was the assistant coach for Team Canada at, um, at three Olympics, and, and he won gold in all three of them, I believe. Um, he's won a few national championships with McGill, a bunch of provincial championships. Um, just a guy who is as professional and as dedicated to the game as any NHL coach that you would see. Um, and really, yeah, so in three words, you know, professional, progressive, um, and very people-oriented. And, you know, I thought to myself, this is somebody that I want to work with. And it so happened that this year he was looking for a video coach, and really that's how I got my foot in the door. Um, you know, in a nutshell, I help Peter do computer things because he is of a certain age and he doesn't have that natural affinity for computer things as perhaps other people. Um, the game. So the women's game is very interesting, you know, in and of itself, but also – as a way to find new insights for NHL teams. You know, if you appreciate possession hockey, the women's team is as close to platonic ideal to possession hockey as you're going to get. 
at the high level, you have some body contact along the boards, but there's no hitting. There's no fighting. There are no goons. There's no instigating. Although girls sometimes do get a little bit heated, which is fun to see. Um, so you don't have that any extracurricular, you know, BS that happens in, in a men's game occasionally. So I, I think it's a really interesting proven ground to explore theory. And I really enjoy the fact that I'm working at McGill because, you know, as a university, you're an institution that's promoting learning and, um, you know, higher education. And you know that you're, you're not here to make a quick buck. You're here to set up these young people to succeed later in life, whatever that they choose to do. So I think, you know, analytics really fits into that mission. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't care that you know, none of these players are going to be playing professionally after at least in the NHL, but I really do want them to succeed while they're here and succeed when they've left. A little bit about our team this year. So we won our provincial championships and we lost in the national finals. So we finished runner up. In that game, we lost five nothing and we outshot the other team 38 to 15. So it happens, you know, it sucks. Um, <laughs> people cried after the game. I cried after the game. Um, but I, I think it's an experience that I wouldn't trade it for the world just because of, you know, the, the family atmosphere that we have. And, you know, I, I was telling our equipment manager who's, um, where is he? He's kind of like two people from the left from me, Johnny. Um, and he wants to be, you know, the first Asian equipment manager for Team Canada in, in some years. Actually, that, you know, he would have to wait a lot longer, I think, to find a job at that level than most of us here just because, you know, you have to essentially wait out the guy in front of you for an equipment manager. But, um, but I was telling him, you know, this is probably the most fun that you're going to have in hockey ever. So enjoy it while you can. So, you know, we were a very strong offensive team. We're a very strong defensive team in terms of preventing shots. And, you know, that's how we generate that really great goal differential and that really great record. And without going into the nitty gritty like uh, Timo just did, you know, we track a lot of things, and for me, it all starts with this, um, I'd say, this framework. And this is a framework, I think, if you take nothing else from my speech today, is if, if you want to work in hockey, you have to work these four pillars, I'd say. So the first pillar is your IT framework. So, you know, what kind of hardware are you using? What kind of software are you using? And how are you storing the data that you're creating? What I mean by that is, you know, even before I started working with Peter, he would have his you know, his players keep track of certain things during a game, whether it's shot attempts, shot location, turnovers, penalties for and against, face-offs. But he didn't really have an IT strategy, right? So all that stuff would be jotted down on paper. It'd be filed away and nobody would ever really look at it again. So he might have like 15 years worth of shot location data in his drawer somewhere, but we can't get to it because it's on paper and it'd be a massive undertaking. Um, to really get that digitized. The second thing is, you know, the data collection is really important. So who collects it, when, where, and how reliable it is. Um, you know, if we've seen what happens with RTSS with the rink effects. So that's really something very important to, to you know, keep in mind also. Third step, I don't think I need to really talk about that much. That's, you know, all the fancy stats, all the metrics that we use. So important, we know it's important. Cool, all right. And the fourth, thing is really the presentation and communications. So whether how it is visualized, how you know, we explain to the coaches and to the players to a lesser extent, um, that's where the rubber meets the road. You can have one, two, and three set up perfectly, but if the coaches don't listen to you, they can't implement policy that drives results. Right? So like all that work is for nothing. And like for me, I'm not really data driven in the sense that you know, I want the data to be perfect. I don't work that way. For me, the golden rule was what can I do today to make Peter's life easier? Whether it is, you know, em embedding all the stats that we track into the video system, whether it is, you know, helping him maybe, you know, catch a nap in the afternoon and scout a game on video instead of having him watch it. Um, whether it is go on the ice to work with the goalies, um, whether it is, you know, um, running out to future shop to buy a thing that we forgot to bring to a tournament. So whatever I do to make Peter's life easier, I do it because that's why I'm there. Right. I'm not there to provide the most accurate, best data. 
No, like I'm there to serve as a resource for him. And I think if somebody wants to work with a team, that's the mindset that you want to adopt because coaches don't sleep a lot. They're very busy. You only have 24 hours in a day. So the best way to add value is to take some slack off for them and for them, you know, to really develop a trust so that they can let you do some things so that they can focus on perhaps other more productive things. Uh, so plans for the future. Uh, losing is a great motivator. You know, we came very close, but we're already thinking about things that we can do better next year, whether it is in terms of hardware, software, or the metrics that we're tracking, all things that we're working on. Uh, some of the things that I've been thinking about is shot quality because, you know, as good as our team was, our PDO was under 100 last year. And at this level, I think, you know, there's an element of luck in it for sure, but I think there's also an element of skill maybe we can do certain things to engineer our PDO to be higher, whether it is on the shooter side or on the goalie side. And, and you know, if you're, the final thing is trying to replace our graduating players. Um, you know, imagine Chicago losing Duncan Keith, Patrick Kane, and Jonathan Taves, because that's what we're losing. Um, we're losing our best possession centerman. We're losing a forward, Leslie Oles, who, when she's on the ice, you know, our team shoots at 12% instead of 8%, which is massive. And I don't think it's luck because she's been here for five years and it's been like that every single year. Um, and we're losing a defenseman, Michelle Daniel, who's playing big minutes, you know, on the power play on the peak okay, and at even strength. So it's going to be very, very challenging for us to, to expect our, you know, second, third, fourth, utmost fate in them. Um, we're also going to have to you know, get our freshman players up to speed in our system, how we play, how and with skills development. Um, and in that process, maybe we'll find some additional advantages that can give us an edge going forward. Uh, final few thoughts, maybe, you know, some things that we can talk about in the breakout rooms, but the eye test, I think if you, you know, obviously it's not perfect, but I think if you don't at least watch the game with your eyes, you're missing out on something because there's no camera as sophisticated, as powerful, and as precise as our eyes. So yeah, sure, use video and then use that video to generate numbers, but watch the game at live speed first, because otherwise I think you're missing out on something. Um, as I mentioned, PDO, skill versus luck. I think at the NHL, there's so much parity that perhaps most of it is luck, but the lower you go down, the more PDO becomes a skill metric as well. And the reason why people should care about women's hockey, well, you know, if this hasn't been enough to convince you, now, if you still play hockey, you have kids who play hockey. Watching women's hockey players move slower, they're smaller, they don't check, they're not as strong, but they do the right things. If you want to talk about generating controlled exits and entries, uh, if you want to talk about manipulating shot location and trying to get a shot from a close to the net instead of you know, throwing it in from the point, watch women's hockey. There's nowhere else in the world that you're going to get that kind of insights. And I think that's something that players of any level can, can learn from. I know that, you know, personally, I'm a much better hockey player after working with these girls because they've taught me things that, you know, I didn't think existed. Thank you.